Now is the time in our service where we prepare to enter into our meditation. So I invite you now to just allow your body to just relax into the seat and just to be still for a moment. Gently closing your eyes or finding a, so a spot to soften your gaze. I invite you now to envision peace. Maybe you see the word peace with your inner eye. Maybe it's more of a feeling. But I invite you to envision peace. Envision peace moving through your body to every cell. From your feet to the top of your head to the crown chakra. Now I invite you to allow that peace to radiate from your body and to begin to touch those around you. Not just sharing the peace that you feel, but the peace that you are. Asking yourself the questions, what color do I envision, do I see when I think of peace? How do I feel when I think of peace? What does this peace look like as I look into the eyes of another person? as we prepare to enter into our moment of silence, I invite you to think about how peace is speaking to you. How might you show up to be the peace that's in the world? How might you radiate that peace to the people around you to this country and to the planet. As we enter into our moment of silence,
So I invite you now to begin to bring your attention and your focus back to this time and to this place. And I encourage you as you, when you leave here today to remember, remember that peace isn't something that we strive for. It's not something to be found in a box or on a shelf. Peace is instead who we are. And we radiate that peace out to everyone and everything around us. Be the peace that you are. Know the peace that you are. Feel the peace that you are. Namaste. And now I invite you to remember, to continue to remember that you're peace as we move into our time of a new Lord's Prayer. So I told the earlier service that I was very grateful for technology because otherwise to give Pete a little bit of a break, I might have to sing and I don't think y'all would want that. I fear this whole place would be empty and that nobody would be live streaming. So, so we're grateful for technology, right? All right, I'll try to behave. We're, we're live streaming now. I told the 915 service we could get wild and crazy because nobody would know, but this one people will know. So I'll be on my best behavior. <laughs> Josie's been around me too long with all this going on, so you'll have to you'll have to forgive her. Oh, uh, see, I like the way Ken thinks. I like that. Uh, so most of you probably know by now that uh, Mindy and I we recently traveled to Texas for my father-in-law's um, celebration of life service, and he and his wife Marilyn they live out in this remote part of te uh, Central Texas. It's like on 20 acres. This thing was like undeveloped land before they moved in, and they've been like weed whacking and just really developing this land, but that's beside the point. I say it's remote, but it's surrounded by these small rural Texas towns. And we also stay with my parents, who also live in a small rural Texas town. And although they live close to Austin, it's still a pretty good drive, and they don't ever see it. They just hang out in the small towns. But now I'm not really sure about rural Wisconsin, so I can't say anything from experience. But one thing I can tell you about rural Texas is that it's very much like what you would see on TV if you've never been there. Very heavy Texas accents, even worse than my own, because it really depends on what part of Texas you're from as to how heavy your accent is. Lots of cowboy boots, and I wore my own today just kind of just to honor Texas a little bit in my trip there. Not the pointed kind, though. Those things are painful to wear, but anyway. But there's lots of cowboy hats, lots of roadside cafes that serve southern food, homemade pies, and tea so sweet it will make your teeth hurt. Somebody at the uh, Celebration of Life service comes up to Mindy and I, they're like, you want a glass of sweet tea? We're like, sure. That thing was like syrup. I couldn't even drink it. It was so sweet. But all of these things just take me back to my childhood. I remember my next door neighbor growing up, her name was Mrs. Davidson, and if you were lucky enough to be in the group of kids playing outside when she made her homemade fried pies, boy, you were lucky. Those things were so good. We'd be playing and she'd present the tray over the fence and be like, would you like a fried pie? Melt in your mouth. Peach was my favorite in case anybody makes any and wants to bring any in for a gift. Peach. And I like a little bit of Cool Whip or vanilla um, ice cream, so thank you. But anyway... But there are also Baptist churches just about on every street corner there in Texas. And I don't mean, even when you're in rural Texas, I don't even mean just your typical rural churches. I'm talking ornate Baptist churches. Some of them have crosses so big you can see them a mile away. And you know that the church is coming up long before you get to the building. But it also takes me back to my childhood because, you know, probably many of you know by now that I grew up in a Baptist church. And I have good memories of growing up in a church. And then, of course, there's some memories that I'd rather forget. But there's one thing that always stuck with me about my experience in a Baptist church, and that's some of the people that I met there. 
Some of them believed a little bit differently than I do now. But they were, and I hope, since I haven't seen any of them in, a, in quite a while, I hope that they're still very wonderful people in their thoughts, deeds, and actions. But it's interesting when I travel back to Texas because it's almost as if my past and my present collide. It creates like this weird paradox, and I, I feel kind of weird when it happens. And I'm re it's almost to where I'm reminded of those beliefs that I grew up with in my past, and now they've helped change the way that I am today, what I believe, the way I interact with the world today in the present. But I've learned to take some of those past teachings and transform them into something that's more powerful, powerful for me today with the spiritual tools and teachings that I've learned along, you know, along the road since, along my journey. And I first realized that this was really happening while I was sitting there in this little rural Baptist church at my father-in-law's celebration of life service. The music was familiar because it's what I grew up with at my Baptist church. But this time I listened to the words unlike when I used, what I used to do when I was a child. And the words didn't necessarily align with my beliefs today. I met the pastor of the church and he was your average Texas pastor. He had on his western belt buckle his cowboy boots, and he had a really deep Texas accent. You think mine's bad? You should have heard him. But he also mentioned how he loved Jesus and guns. I mean, where else are you going to hear that other than a Texas church? Jesus and guns mixed together. But one of the things the pastor mentioned, <laughs> well, Suzanne, Suzanne really liked that. but <laughs> I know, I know what you mean. But one of the things the pastor mentioned was the fact that we are all sinners. He said this during the service. My past and my present colliding. Past beliefs, present beliefs colliding with each other. And that's always been a tough one for me when I hear that, when I hear that we're all sinners, because it leaves me with this very unpleasant feeling within. And I'm not trying to negate anybody's belief systems here, because I've always been of the belief that if it brings you comfort, that's where you should be in a religious or a spiritual sense. It doesn't matter whether I agree with it or not. As long as it brings comfort, that's where somebody should be. But thinking about how we're all sinners just did not resonate with me. It never really did in my childhood either. I always used to hear so much about how God was love. I'd hear we were sinners, but then I'd hear how God was love. And I would think, how could something that is love hold such a contempt for something, such as myself? Or to like shove me back into a corner and just say, well, that's a sinner. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to deal with that right now. And I remember thinking as a child, you know, what's the point of even going to church? I mean, what was the point in trying to please this God that I was never likely going to be able to even please in the first place? And he, I use the term he because that's the way we learned about it growing up. He was always angry about something, it seemed. Or looking for something to become angry over. Going to church just seemed fruitless at that point. And even if I decided to cuss, as I did when I was a child, and still do sometimes, I'll admit it. But it seemed like that even if I got right with God for that, that there was something else he was surely going to dig up to get angry over. But here at Unity, we look at sin a little bit differently. We learn that sin is a false sense of separation from God within. And we learn that we aren't this disobedient disdain in the eyes of what I was always taught, this man named God somewhere. So there was a place in where I felt my past intersect with my present at that service. With what I know now to be true... And that is that we are these amazing, wonderful beings. These amazing, wonderful manifestations of God, or as something I've shared with you before, which was something that a ministerial friend of mine always says, the eyes through which the universe sees itself. And if this is all true, how can I be anything less? How can I be this sinner that I used to hear so much about? we learn that we need to just simply remember that we can never be separated 
from this God that resides within. Now some of you have been around unity for a while and have probably heard of the Unity 5 Principles. If you haven't and you'd like to learn more, definitely talk to me or Unity Minister Reverend Ellen Devonport has written a wonderful book called The Five Principles. And it breaks each of the principles down very nicely and gives a really good in-depth of understanding of each one. So if you don't know a lot about them, I highly encourage you to get that booklet. But the one I want to mention right now is the second principle. And that second principle states, Our essence is of God. Therefore, we are inherently good. This God essence was fully expressed in Jesus the Christ. So let's think about that for a moment. Let's let that really sink in for just a moment. Our essence is of God. Therefore, we are inherently good. This God essence was fully expressed in Jesus the Christ. So how could we be anything less than good given the fact that our essence is of God? How can we be this detestable thing that God has written off as a sinner? Now Jesus, our master metaphysician here at Unity, he gave us a very important message in the biblical book of John chapter 14 verse 12. Verily truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these. He spelled it out very clearly. He gave us the prescription that we need. And I look at the key phrase in that statement, and that is, the one who believes. The one who believes and the one who knows. That is the person that has faith that you are the very essence of God. That you are divine. That you are an amazing, wonderful, spiritual being through which the universe sees itself. Through which the universe works and through which the universe is able to experience what it means to live in this human experience. Jesus was letting us know that we can do exactly what he did. We simply just need to believe. What I also know to be true is that we can't be sinners because of the fact of the matter is, is that we can never be separate from God. It may feel like it sometimes, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but it still doesn't make it true. Another thing I remember hearing about at the Celebration of Life service, is that my father-in-law was currently experiencing the splendor of this place called heaven, in one of its, that he had obtained one of its many mansions. Now Jesus did mention something about mansions in the Bible in John 14 too. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. Now the pastor at the Baptist church we were at, he meant mansions in a literal sense. Another blast from my past. The church I grew up in taught me as I was growing up that when I passed from this life that I would go to this place called heaven and I would walk on these streets paved of gold and be handed these these keys to my very own mansion. And of course the road, I was taught the roads to these riches was long and tumultuous, but I learned that of course I'd get there as long as I avoided angering that man called God. Now first, I talked about this in the first service. I'd imagine that if an actual mansion exists in heaven, that it's also going to require a a great deal of housekeeping to keep that thing clean. I don't want to do that in the afterlife. I don't know about any of you. I think all of us had have enough of that in this lifetime. I don't want it after our transition. And I mean, there may be staff that you can hire there, but man, that person got the short end of the stick having to spend the afterlife cleaning houses. Why torture that poor soul any more than what they have to be tortured? But bring me a cozy cabin in the woods and I'm good. So, But personally, I'm glad that we don't view that verse in a literal sense. Jesus was known for his parables. It was said that when he taught and when he spoke, people traveled far and wide to hear him tell these parables. 
Now, Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore defined mansions as degrees of realization of the truth of being. Degrees of realization of the truth of being. So let's backtrack for a minute and let's talk about mansions in a literal sense. You can, you've probably seen them on TV or driving around and you've noticed that some of them are pretty nice, right? They're ornate. I've seen on TV that some have bowling alleys and movie theaters and some have really nice swimming pools that almost mimic nature to where people can be swimming in these things and think they're out somewhere in paradise. Then there are other types of mansions. There are those that feel a little sterile on the inside, right? Some you look at, you see on TV, you're like, oh man, I wouldn't want to live there. That's just not cozy. But I'd imagine a lot of the people that live in these mansions aren't home very often because they're probably having to be out a lot making money to be able to afford to live in the mansion, right? So as a result, some of them probably just aren't very lived in. They've got this coldness to them or this lack of warmth, so to speak. They're just not overly inviting. Some mansions also have these nice and cozy rooms that are easy to find. The layout's good. You walk in, you know right where the kitchen is, where the bedrooms are. They're laid out and everything's easily acceptable or accessible. But some you might walk into and they have rooms that are a little more obscure. They're difficult to find. Maybe they've got hidden passages or hidden rooms. You may even get lost while navigating to some of the various passages that lead to some of the rooms that you're trying to find. Jesus mentioned many mansions, but he was talking about the mansions that we hold inside of here. I would imagine people who build literal mansions help design those mansions, right? They have a say-so in whether they're cozy or not, whether the rooms are easy to find or whether they're inviting. I'm thinking that we probably likely have the same choice for the mansions inside of here, a choice in which we realize the truth of who we are, which often results in how we perceive and live our human experience. Do we choose the uninviting mansion that we just kind of live in from time to time? Do we choose to only live halfway? So here I want to talk about, I want to bring in unity principles again, but I want to talk about the fifth principle. Through thoughts, words, and actions, we live the truth we know. So basically, we can understand spiritual teachings and truth all we want. We can read about it in books, we can listen to podcasts, we can listen to talks, watch YouTube channels. But we also have to live these things. To do this, we have to realize and we have to practice. We can't just read about it in books or come here on Sundays and hear it and think, oh, that's nice, and then just go out and forget about it. We have to practice it, we have to realize it, we have to know it and live it. But sometimes, though, we're too busy making plans for a mansion that just won't suit us. Or we can build it and move into it, and we don't feel good in it once we get settled into it. When we do this, we haven't quite grasped the realization that we can have a mansion that better suits us. The only thing we know at this point is that we want something that better suits us. We just don't know yet what's missing in the current mansion. But once we make the realization of what's missing, we are ready to move into something that suits our liking and our taste maybe just a little bit more. Something that better suits the way in which we want to live our lives. When we do this, we'll find that we're also able, we're also able to help others to find their own mansions. Find them that suit those a little bit more. Help them find the mansions that are something more in alignment with what they also seek what it is that's also the truth about them. So I say some of these things today due to current events that are happening right now in our country. I don't think there's any of us in here that, know, that don't know that our history hasn't always been favorable. In fact, there are many moments in our history that aren't even really history after all. Things happening that aren't so much in the past as they should be and aren't necessarily a blast from the past, but something that is still very much present today. Racism and other situations in which we don't treat each and every person as the inherent good that he or she is. 
perhaps not treating each person as the truth of who and what they really are, the very essence of God. My recent blast from the past forced me to remember my own history, my own journey, and where it is that I've come from. But it doesn't have to define who or where I am today. And it doesn't have to be that way for any of us, right? Things we may have believed, things we may still believe whether they're true or not. we just got to be willing to move forward. We've got to be willing to recognize, we've got to be willing to know, and to accept truth and to live that truth. We've got to be willing to realize that there are many questions, or uh, many mansions. The question is, which one are you going to choose? And as far as how we treat others, Jesus had a pretty good prescription for that one too. One that isn't so blast from the past. One that is still very much applicable right here and right now. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so must you love one another. John 13, 34. Namaste. Okay, now to switch gears a little bit. <laughs> also, I just wanted to say that, you know, everybody's streaming online. It's wonderful to feel your energy out there as you stream with us today. And for those of you in the room, it is so wonderful to see your faces. So thank you for being here today. It just it's, brings me great joy. Okay, so while you're preparing, it's time for our offertory now. And while you're preparing your tithes and offerings, I remind you to just continue to keep an eye on our website because we've got a lot of events that are still going to be online only. And then we've got some that are going to kind of become hybrids and some that are in person. So just keep an eye on our website. And of course, if you've got any questions about whether something is meeting in person or online, definitely call the office, shoot me an email, call me something, and we'll, we'll help you out with that. And I also want you, I would also invite you to remember that Silent Unity is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's a wonderful resource. If you're shy about getting on the phone, you can email them your prayer requests. They've got a contact form you can use. And I like that one because they'll send you back a, a prayer in writing and I can look at it anytime I want to. So I, I like that. But So I invite you to uh, remember to, to check that out. And I, I want to thank you. I want to continue to thank you all for your kind gifts that you've given this church. You have enabled us to continue to keep going like normal. It has been wonderful, and we are so grateful for each and every one of you and for investing in your spiritual community, your spiritual home. So I invite you now to please take your tithes and offerings in your hand and to place them over your heart as we say together our offeratory blessing. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. Now, I want to let you know we are not going to be passing the baskets around. The basket you will see will be on the door as you exit, so please just place your gift in there as you exit. And now our offeratory song, I Am So Blessed. <laughs> 